thanks again, Kevin. Um, I'm just going to talk at you for a couple of minutes because um, uh, we have lots of uh, great researchers that actually know what they're talking about that are coming up uh, after after I speak. But I did want to uh, let you know about a very exciting research finding that we've come up with in the last, uh, really just the last couple weeks at the Institute. Um, uh, most people think that um, hacking as we know it dates back uh, about uh, 30, 40 years to actually what Kevin was talking about, the, um, uh, the phone uh, tone hacks that, um, that uh, would allow you to spoof the, uh, oh, that makes sense, that's the correct volume, <laughs> that's why you don't want lawyers touching technical stuff. Um, thanks, thanks Matt. Um, uh, but actually we found out through some of our research that it's a lot, uh, hacking is a lot older than that. Um, and so, all right, well, that's going nowhere. Uh, all right, uh, look, um, the blessing and the curse of working in cybersecurity is that no matter where and when I speak, there's always uh, some uh, good news, bad news, usually bad news, things that have happened just in the last couple of days. So just in the last week, uh, I wanted to mention a few things. It was revealed that hackers had successfully attacked the U.S. power utility. Uh, although power uh, distribution was not affected, uh, DHS has confirmed that there was a successful attack. Uh, literally just in the last hour, Equifax has announced, uh, for those anybody who still thinks that uh, data breaches don't cost anything, Equifax has uh, spent and lost about $1.4 billion with a B uh, dollars as a result of the hack uh, from last year, and that number is still counting. Uh, the city of Baltimore had to shut down almost all of its systems, including uh, taking emergency services offline last week due to a ransomware attack. And uh, uh, for the math folks here, um, apparently at least one set of researchers believe that as soon as 2028, uh, it will be possible uh, through quantum, quantum computing to defeat every single type of encryption that exists today. And of course, encryption is the basis for almost all uh, cybersecurity. So, plenty of good news happening uh, right now. So, the most common question I get is how much should we worry about cyber threats? And I worry a lot. Uh, in fact, I am certain that when people tell me I worry too much, they're wrong. I worry exactly the right amount <laughs> because you can never worry too much about cyber threats. Um, and as a result, this is my screensaver. Uh, just, to, uh, just to keep in mind what we're, what we're up against. There's uh, about four trends uh, that we think here at the Institute are going to potentially combine to create a perfect storm in the next 10 years or so. The first one is that it's projected uh, in some research that by 2025 there will be one trillion, one trillion with a T devices connected to the internet. And just by way of comparison in 2016, there was a massive distributed denial of service attack that took down uh, many of our favorite internet services, took down the, power, the internet in this country of Liberia completely offline for a couple of days, and was actually so powerful that a, a very famous uh, cybersecurity researcher who had contracted with Akamal to provide enough bandwidth and enough uh, resources so he couldn't be taken offline by this denial of service attack. In the middle of the attack, they basically told him, we can't cover you, you're on your own. Now, it's estimated that in, 19, in 2016, when these things happened, there were 23 billion, with a B, devices connected to the Internet. And as most of you know, the way uh, you control the power of a denial of service attack is by how many devices you can take over and enlist in your service to conduct the attack. Now, as a lawyer and intelligence officer, I don't do math. Uh, but if you compare 23 billion to 1 trillion, hold on for a second, carry the five, that's a lot more uh, capacity by 2025. So that's thing one. Thing two, obviously we have rogue states with unstable uh, leaders, um, uh, not naming any names because I just learned my hard drive can be a microphone, um, but you can see the photos. Uh, uh, much more power than ever before. In fact, uh, small countries and even uh, organized crime and terrorist groups and individuals now are able to have the type of power to conduct attacks that even 10 or 15 years ago only major nation states could conduct. And, and as we've learned in the last couple of years, uh, many of these leaders believe there are absolutely no rules that control them at all. And in fact, uh, that's the third problem, that the status of uh, cyber law and treaties uh, around the globe is so weak that it's basically just the Wild West out there. So 
no one even really knows what the rules are. And so you have this very dangerous situation where a country like, let's just pick one at random, let's say North Korea, uh, decides that they want to launch a cyber attack on the United States in retaliation for, I don't know, let's say releasing a movie about their leader. Um, and they think that the threshold for what constitutes cyber war justifying a return attack is here, but we think it's here. So when they're operating in that zone of, of disagreement, that's when you get maximum danger because the United States, Russia, and China have all declared publicly that a cyber attack of significant, of sufficient magnitude can be responded to with a kinetic attack, bombs, missiles, uh, troops. In fact, Russia has even said they reserve the right to respond to such an attack with nuclear weapons. So if anybody thinks these risks are hypothetical, I give you two examples. One, uh, as some of you may know, there has been an economic blockade uh, underway by uh, many of the Gulf states against the country of Qatar. Uh, for a couple of years, that economic blockade was actually started because of a video that ran on Qatari state TV in which their leader said a number of things that were highly inflammatory uh, to, their, uh, to their Sunni Muslim neighbors. Uh, the problem was that that leader actually never said any of those things. What happened was the, the Qatari uh, uh, TV network was hacked. The hackers took a bunch of uh, clips of the leader saying different things and created what we're now calling a deep fake attack uh, that put out a video that uh, made it look like this leader actually said these inflammatory things. Next thing you know, there's a blockade and uh, for the military folks here, diplomats, um, uh, an economic blockade is one step short of a military blockade which is one step short of all out war. Now, it turns out after a few missteps, the FBI concluded that this attack was launched from Russia but after first publicly declaring that it was launched by the Russians, a couple weeks later they came back and said, oh, sorry, never mind, it actually wasn't the Russian government, it was hackers located inside Russia. So in this case, you know, the Qataris are not going to take on the <coughs> Russians, okay? But if these had been other countries that were larger with more military capability and more parity, this could have gone an entirely different way. And, ripped straight from the headlines, within the last 10 days, the Israelis have bombed with kinetic weapons, bombs, uh, a building in which they believe that a Hamas hacker was located. So they have actually now taken military uh, strike against a, a perceived hacking operation. And speaking of our friend here in the picture who shall not be named, the Florida governor, literally 20 minutes ago, while I was sitting there, I got an alert. The Florida governor has now publicly announced that at least two Florida voter databases were hacked by Russia in 2016. This is the first public confirmation of that. And finally, uh, in addition to the uncertainty of the rules and laws of war in this area, uh, seems to be the complete unwillingness or inability of our government uh, to protect us from these kind of attacks. So you have now private companies, Sony, Google, etc., who are being attacked by other governments as though they were governments, but these companies have no real lawful way of defending themselves. And, We'll have an event sometime about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but for any of you guys with aggressive IT departments, it is not legal to take any kind of action against someone attacking you outside of your firewall, even including putting a, a piece of code in your sensitive materials that allows you to, to track who took it because it phones home when it gets to its location. That is a felony under U.S. law still. I think that's probably going to change, but right now we're in this kind of a situation where, uh, as this oldie-timey map indicates, I couldn't find one uh, that has the, lot. you'll see a lot of these maps that have a legend on it that says, here there be monsters. And uh, I don't think anybody who made these maps actually thought there was a sea monster sitting in the middle of the Caribbean, but my contention is that what the, the governments who made these maps were trying to tell sailors is you go into these waters and we don't know what's out there and we can't help you, you're on your own. And unfortunately, I think that's kind of where we are in cyberspace today. Now I usually end this talk and I see a lot of friends out there who have heard me say all this stuff before with the exact same graphics. Why? Because it's really hard to get copyright clearance to use new <laughs> graphics. Um, but I usually end it by saying <clears throat> I used to be an intelligence officer and a lawyer. Now I'm an academic so I don't have to actually solve any problems. I just have to identify them. Um, but I'm pr proud and happy to say that we think we're going to be able to help avoid this kind of a situation because here at UCI we actually have people 
who have solutions, and I'm going to introduce the first one of those now. So Sam Malik, in addition to being my co-sponsor uh, today as the director of the UCI Institute for Software Research, he's an associate professor in ICS Informatics. Sam received his PhD and master's degrees from some school up north, USC or something. Um, <laughs> but he got his BS in information computer sciences here at Irvine, uh, received numerous awards for his research contributions, including the National Science Foundation Career Award, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, his bio is on his website. I'm not going to take any more of his speaking time, but thanks a lot, Sam. So uh, I'm Sam Malik, I'm the Director of the Institute for Software Research. Uh, I want to welcome you, uh, on behalf of ISR, welcome you to, to this event. Uh, I want to thank Brian and, um, and you know, the whole CPRI Institute for um, inviting us to co-sponsor this event. Um, so I'll, before I uh, tell you a little bit about um, the work that we're doing in the mobile application space, let me tell you, give you an overview of ISR, uh, since some of you may not be familiar with it. So, ISR is actually one of the oldest research institutes at UCI, given that UCI is a pretty young university uh, itself. So we've been around for 20 years. Um, so the mission of the institute is to advance software and information technology through uh, research partnerships. Uh, about 30 faculty or so, uh, mostly from UCI, but also from other universities. Um, approximately 60 graduate students. Uh, so we well, cover a, a pretty broad space uh, within the world of software, so mostly software engineering, but also human aspects of computing. And obviously security and privacy are some key aspects of, or key research, um, um, uh, research interests uh, within the Institute, and so that's where the uh, intersect with uh, CPRI is. And so um, these are some of the activities that we have. Uh, so we have uh, collaborations with industry uh, participants, uh, joint research projects, um, you know, uh, internships, uh, you know, transitioning technology, developing the research lab to companies. Uh, so lots of uh, interesting activities there. Uh, we have various events that we organize. Um, so we have thematic workshops like the one that we, that we have today. But we also have our annual uh, SOCAL <coughs> Software Engineering Symposium. So we have a symposium coming up on June 7th. It's an all-day event, um, somewhat similar to this, a little broader scope. Uh, and so we have faculty from all over SOCAL come in. Uh, I encourage you to also attend that. And, and there's lots of other uh, activities at, at, at ISR. I recommend that you go to our website and check out um, the research that we do and the activities that, that we're involved in. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, now get into the uh, research component of my talk. And so this essentially is actually joint work with, uh, within several other faculty members at ISR, specifically Joshua Garcia. And so um, we've been looking at uh, mobile application security for the past uh, eight years or so. And actually, let me kind of step back. Actually, my own interests essentially are in studying complex systems. And so um, this spaghetti that you're looking at is, in fact, the reverse engineer view of uh, Linux kernel. And so um, the point of this figure is to show that, well, if you can't, well, if, 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 when, when you consider these complex systems, um, the question is, how can you, uh, in person, uh, properties about these systems, specifically security properties about them. And so a lot of uh, my research has been on um, developing techniques to evaluate the trustworthiness and security properties of such complex uh, systems. And specifically as it relates to, to the IoT, we've been looking at mobile systems, uh, especially um, app stores, uh, where you have lots and lots of um, apps that are being um, de developed and deployed in, in this setting. So this shows the number of apps in the um, in the marketplace, and so there's an uh, additional urgency of being able to develop techniques that help us in automatically um, vet security and trustworthiness of these apps uh, because of just the sheer number of apps and also the high churn rate of these apps on these, on these app markets. So apps, uh, as probably most of you uh, know, uh, pose, uh, can pose severe security and privacy um, uh, concerns. Uh, so your phone essentially, you know, I like to think about my phone as essentially a bag of sensors that I have with me at all times, it's in my pocket, and 
Um, so it has access to lots of information, you know, from camera to microphone to lots of other sensors. And so uh, if an app is malicious, it's able to exploit a lot of um, private, um, private information that users have. And in some ways you can think about, um, in, in many ways I think exploitation of, of a cell phone or a smartphone is more problematic than, than, than an attack or an exploitation of a desktop or laptop just because of the, um, the availability of the device and, and the, the amount of information that you have on it. So um, there is essentially a perfect storm uh, in the sense that app stores uh, provide uh, a, a very convenient vehicle for um, attackers to deliver malicious uh, code, malicious payload to, uh, to consumers, um, billions of consumers that, 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 are, um, that, are developing, that, are, that are using apps on these stores. Um, market operators are overwhelmed by the sheer number of apps and, uh, and the churn rate of these apps. Um, automated tools uh, generally have um, Theoretical limitations. Uh, so you know, if, for those that work in program analysis, they know that you know there's lot, lots of limitations as to what you can actually automatically infer um, about um, about programs, and lots of incentives for attackers in terms of uh, private information, um, you know, the adware and so on and so forth. So lots of reasons for attackers to actually try to attack these um, platforms. And so, uh, not surprisingly, uh, well, this figure you can't really see. Uh, but I guess the resolution is is, is not. Um, it's not shown up here, but basically what you, what you see is that the number of malware is growing rapidly uh, in the Android space. And so lots of attackers are, um, are targeting this platform. And more importantly, there are um, a lot of vulnerable apps out there. So, um, you know, so this was actually an article that actually Brian sent me. It's from a few weeks ago that um, talks about an Android app, um, essentially a Wi-Fi uh, manager. Uh, that has been leaking, uh, that has leaked over 2 million Wi-Fi passwords. And this app was available as of the date of this article on Google Play, uh, downloaded by hundreds of thousands of users. Um, it turns out the reason the app was leaking all these Wi-Fi passwords was a small, simple uh, uh, mistake in the, in the implementation of the app, uh, where the content provider, which is a database in, in the app, was uh, not protected, so other applications can in fact access the content and the Wi-Fi passwords that were stored on this on this, on this app. So, um, a question then uh, is, you know, what are the causes of these uh, security <coughs> issues in, in in Android? And you know, we can talk about it at length. Uh, I'm going to talk about three um, categories of issues that I think are contributing to the security um, um, security issues in the platform. Um, one of them is that the platform itself has um, some serious design flaws. Um, so, uh, specifically, the platform, the, the Android platform, uh, I personally don't think was really designed with security in mind uh, from the get-go. So, it, for example, uh, systematically violates uh, the least uh, privilege principle, which essentially is a principle that says that uh, you want to grant uh, only the required uh, permission to the components of your system that are needed for achieving or performing the functionality. And so the platform, the way it implements permissions uh, to access resources uh, is such that it uh, systematically violates that principle. And so I'll show you that using an Android system here, essentially think about this as a cell phone uh, with two apps on it. And so here you, um, the, the, let's say each of these apps requests uh, access to certain permissions. So app A requests access to GPS, to location information. App B requests access to be able to send text messages. Um, so, you know, if this app consists of hundreds of thousands of lines of code, if it has um, tens of components, um, probably only a very small subset of these components actually need to have access to these permissions that are requested by the app. But the way the platform implements the permission system is that those, um, those permissions are in fact granted to all the components in the app. And so what you have here is a systematic violation of least privileged principle because if I'm going to manually um, check the security properties of the system, now instead of checking only the components that have access to those resources uh, that, that can potentially leak some private <coughs> information, now I'm going to have to uh, check the entire uh, code base of the system. And if I'm going to build automated tools, kind of the same thing, the automated tools are going to have a hard time scaling up because the platform allows for um, this information to be available uh, in the entire app. Um, so this is kind of a, this is, this essentially is uh, overprivileged access to resources. Um, also the way um, the, uh, the architecture of the system is implemented is that, um, so obviously within an application components can talk to each other, uh, but instead of making the interfaces of components to be um, private by default and, and secure, 
in Android, by default, your components are actually public. So uh, when you define your intent filters, which are essentially the interfaces of your components, um, what that means is that the components can be accessed by default from other applications. And so you can see this poses a severe security problem because now you have a system that is where it's architecture essentially is a spaghetti, right? Unless the developer actually takes care of making the interfaces private, um, all components within the within installed on the device can potentially talk to each other. Again, uh, this is a horrible design idea from uh, from both from security standpoint. Whether whether you're going to manually investigate this or whether you're going to automatically investigate the security parts of your system, it's going to uh, challenge. Um, it's going to challenge the. Uh, it's going to make it very difficult to, to do so. Basically. Um, the second category of issues, so for the first category of the challenge, I think, has to do with the fact that the platform was designed not with really security um, in mind or had some security flaws in it. Um, the second issue is that a lot of security analysis tools that we have at our disposal are not really up to the task. And so this is where I think universities can come in and help with, um, with, these, uh, with these issues. So we did a, um, we did a study of um, all modern, essentially, um, anti-malware um, products, so six, more than 60 anti-malware products for Android apps. And uh, what we found is that most of these anti-malware products can be easily bypassed through simple code obfuscations. Um, so, uh, in fact, we, we looked at uh, the, probably the most simplest uh, uh, obfuscation you can do is to actually change some, uh, add some permissions to an app and, and revoke certain permissions from it, essentially modify the Android manifest file. And so even with the simplest obfuscations like that, we could bypass the um, anti-malware products. Um, we, we could degrade their performance by 30%. Uh, some of the more advanced ones, like dynamic code loading, encryption, and so on, can uh, essentially make these anti-malware products completely uh, useless. And so, what we need are better tools uh, to help us secure um, these platforms. And the third category of issues has to do with the fact that I think your typical Android developer is not a professional software engineer that actually um, works at works at an established software development company that actually cares about security properties. And so, one of the things that we found in our research is that a lot of times when we found security issues, even when we actually identified the security exploits, when we would contact developers and let them know about the security issue, um, they, would, um, they would either be kind of ignorant about it or, or they would not even fix it in the next versions of the app. So there is, there is this kind of a, um, there is this concern about, well, how much do our developers actually care about the security, um, security uh, properties of, of these apps? And, and so that's, uh, that's kind of a more of a human side of, 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 of cybersecurity that Brian alluded to earlier. All right, so we've been trying to address these uh, security issues in, in my research, and I don't have the time to go through details of them, but I will give you the three um, angles of attack that we've applied in, in my group over the past you know, eight years or so. Um, so the first angle is to try to detect, okay, so detection. And so here uh, we worked on an approach called Reveal Droid, which basically tries to address the fact that existing anti-malware products are, um, are, are vulnerable to obfuscation. And so the idea was to perform program analysis where we would extract certain features about the program, <coughs> about the app, and these features would be extracted in such a way that they will be obfuscation resilient. So for example, instead of extracting features about the internal behavior of the app, we would actually extract features dealing with the interaction of the app and its environment. Um, and then we would apply machine learning techniques, which at a high level essentially is the idea of trying to learn a function that can distinguish between what is malicious versus what is, what is, what is benign. And so uh, we showed that this technique actually is, um, uh, is, 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 is able to, is, is both obfuscation resilient and it, it outperforms all existing uh, commercial antivirus products, at least as of a couple of years, um, couple of years ago. Uh, another contribution of this work was the fact that we wouldn't only just tell you whether something is malicious or benign, but we would actually also tell you the type of malware, the malware family uh, that, that, that the malware belongs to, and that is very important because if you find the malware in your device, you also want to know what the malware was doing so you can figure out how to uh, recover from, from the attack and so on. And so uh, this work uh, was actually sponsored by DHS, and so this actually shows you uh, one of the evaluation results that we have. So we get uh, roughly about 94% correct classification rate uh, with 49 um, uh, Android malware families. So we have a classifier that essentially can tell you whether something's malicious or benign, and if it's malicious, it tells you which one of these 49 malware families it belongs to. And so this at the time was actually the um, most um, most effective um, anti-malware um, product based on our evaluations. Um, the, so the product was sponsored by DHS and it's available and it's being deployed and used by DHS. So there's actually a website here 
and I believe actually uh, various uh, companies can actually get gain access to the tool uh, by going through the registration process, and so I think it's actually uh, freely available to um, companies and, and government agencies. Um, the second angle of attack that we've had on this on security issues in Android is has been through prevention. So prevention is uh, more dealing with the vulnerabilities. So we're trying to provide tools for developers to produce applications that are secure um, uh, and essentially detect vulnerabilities before they are actually shipped with, uh, with the code. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the early works that we did in this space was Covert, which essentially you can think about as an IDE <coughs> plugin. So it's a plugin that you, that you can install on your IDE and uh, allows the tool and employs program analysis techniques. So as developers developing the application, uh, it's able to detect security vulnerabilities and is then able to um, localize where the vulnerabilities are, um, uh, find, show it to you in the source code, and allow us to walk through it and so on. And so essentially you can think about like a debugging capability for vulnerabilities. So we did some experiments with this. So for example, we found dozens of previously unknown security vulnerabilities in top 500 um, popular um, Android apps. So, so detection, where we try to detect malicious behavior, prevention, where we try to develop tools to help developers in, in producing uh, secure code. And the third angle of attack is exploitation, and this is more, more, this is more recent work and what I'm actually really excited about. And so um, here we are looking at the difference between vulnerability and exploitation. So a vulnerability is a weakness that may lead to security failure. Um, and so there's been prior research, prior studies that have shown that a lot of developers don't really actually, developers and security analysts, don't care about vulnerabilities um, because a lot of, uh, tools produce, um, static analysis tools, uh, tools in particular, uh, produce uh, vulnerability warnings that end up being false positive, meaning that, um, so the key word here is may, because it's a weakness that may lead to a security problem, but in fact, most of the time, they don't uh, produce security issues. And what most people care about is exploitability. So it's a vulnerability that can actually be successfully used by an attacker, right? So, and so what, what really developers and security analysts want from tools, from tool developers, is to produce tools that actually can produce exploits. And so that's been a space where we've been working uh, a lot in the past a couple of years. And so one of the uh, pieces of work that we did in this space uh, uh, targeting Android was a letter bomb, which is an automated, automatic exploit generation tool for Android apps. And so automatic exploit, exploit generation essentially is like, is like automated hacking, basically. What you're trying to do here is you're trying to emulate what the, uh, what the hackers do, what the attackers do to try to not only find vulnerabilities, but try to actually see if those vulnerabilities are executable and whether, whether through exception of those vulnerabilities you can actually attack, uh, attack the application or not. And so um, in one experiment that we did on 10,000 Google Play apps, uh, we found uh, 181, so close to 200 zero-day exploits. Uh, these were not vulnerabilities, these were, the, these were actually security issues that we found in the top 10,000 uh, Google Play apps. And so, um, Again, to our surprise, when we reported these exploits to developers, some of them acknowledge the issues and go about fixing them. Some of them <coughs> just don't really respond to emails. And so that's, that's a separate issue for, 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 a, uh, for a separate um, talk. Uh, so that's uh, all I have uh, today. Uh, I think I'm out of time. I'm happy to answer questions that you might have. Any questions? Okay. Thanks a lot, right. Sam. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I gather two takeaways from Sam's talk. One is get an iPhone, <laughs> uh, and the other is support the Institute for Software Research so you can return to an Android in a few years. <laughs> Our next presenter is um, uh, Shri Beredway. I hope I said that somewhere close to correctly. Uh, Shri is the Director of Clinical and Business Applications and the Chief Information Security Officer at UCI Health and has more than 25 years of information management systems expertise in multiple industries, including healthcare. He's held leadership positions in health plans and has deep expertise in applications development, IT infrastructure, and operations. He's a past committee member uh, for the CIO Healthcare Summits and currently serves as the chair of the Privacy and Security Committee for the National Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society. Tree, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So you heard these researchers talking about a bunch of mumbo-jumbo in my world, right? 
And I'll talk to you about my mumbo jumbo that happens in my world. We live in this world of, uh, how do I call it? Um, our patients, physicians, and people who don't understand technology. That's the world I live in. So every day I battle, uh, I kind of a warrior, uh, with, with physicians who try to understand why do I have to redo my password every 90 days. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's one way of looking at it. And then I also have to deal with patients who want to bring in their own devices and stick it in my network and figure out, why is it not working? <laughs> so that's, that's my life. Um, and here's an example, right? Uh, this is something that happened actually to a patient. A patient has actually said that, you know, uh, Alexa has ordered 100 packs of Ricola. I don't even know why it did it, but it did it, right? Somebody spelled Ricola, and somebody else was saying 100 in the same room, and somebody was uh, shouting Alexa. How many, of you have, how many of you guys have Alexas in the room? Show hands. I see a few hands here. And just have that on the kitchen table. You will get recipes to do whatever you want, which may not even turn out like food. Uh, been there, done that. <clears throat> so, um, and the thing is, today I'm going to give you a bit of a perspective from a, um, a outside of the educational, academic aspect here, so you guys get a flavor for what I go through on a daily basis. Um, I sit on the Healthcare Cyber Security Council uh, for Health and Human Services, um, which is a public-private partnership. Uh, also, um, I represent um, um, the uh, board member of the Economic uh, American Executives in Healthcare Information Security. So, kind of other appointments outside of the UCI day-to-day uh, -day aspect of uh, my living. Um, this is UCI. Uh, discover, teach, heal is our uh, mission. Uh, discover is what um, you guys help with and so does teach. And uh, on the medical center side, we deal with the heal aspect of it, where we deploy uh, physicians, clinicians, nurses, uh, radiology therapists, uh, physiotherapists, and so on uh, to cure diseases. Uh, there are certain customary slides we include in every presentation, so you'll see uh, some of this stuff in here, but I just wanted to make sure you understand uh, UCI is probably one of those more premier organizations from a medical center perspective. Uh, carrying a lot for our patients in the country and also uh, in, a, in some ways internationally as well. Only Academic Medical Center, um, uh, Level 1 Adult and Trauma uh, Centers, uh, American Heart Association Gold Plus Quality Award for Heart Failure State. So this, these are certain things that we do. This is uh, just by numbers and you can see what's going on. And this is my life. <laughs> So when I look at this picture, um, I, 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 I every day do this in a way that helps them understand why security is important. That's my goal. And it's always tough to help somebody understand um, why when Kevin was talking about the uh, ways you, make, you can make the hard drive swing and you know, uh, while uh, Sam was talking about how do I make these mobile devices more secure, uh, it's, it's great for me when you, when you present from an academic perspective, when you sit down and have a conversation with a physician or a patient, it just doesn't go nowhere. I can tell you right now. It just, the, the, the way this works is there's this dichotomy between what we, what we talk about from an academic perspective and the actual um, practical aspect of how we deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I go about saying this. Right? So, and, and, and in a way that this makes sense. But why, why is this happening today? <clears throat> this is what's happening to us. You guys get this? And this is what we become. This is from a concept uh, uh, taken in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> it's an interesting concept. Uh, and imagine if, people, uh, if Alexis was in everybody's hands. You would not hear music, you would hear noise, right? So this is, this is what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis when we've got people coming in and looking at what we need to do. Topic of today. Do you know how much data is generated from the healthcare system today? Probably trillions of data, probably millions in a minute. And that's our situation. We've got so much data being pumped into the industry right now. 
10, 12 years ago, just to give you perspective, uh, 10, 12 years ago, we did not have uh, an electronic medical record where our physicians could go in and, and input the information and get your care so that they can look at research that somebody else has done and give you the better care as they see it. Uh, today, we have electronic medical records that are fairly ubiquitous in terms of what happens today, and uh, there's churns and churns of data happening in it. In addition to this, we take Fitbit data, we take uh, uh, Alexa data, we take uh, Apple Watch data, and pump that also into our uh, electronic medical record system to really see what you guys do or don't do, rather, right? I mean, if I, if I want to know if my patient is... Uh, is, is, an, is following my exercise regimen and I download the Apple watch that he wears every day, I may not get much, right? So then what do I do? Like, do I say, you got to exercise more? I told him last time he came for my visit. So that's where there is a difference lies. And now I have to believe and realize that that Apple watch may not be worn by him at all times. That information that's coming from Apple watch may be, uh, in my world, compromised uh, from what is being dealt with. Uh, the data that's coming from the Fitbit may really be not effective enough for me to take and make decisions. So how do I believe this information that's coming out from these medical devices that are every day worn by, by our patients and, uh, uh, across the board? And then how do I make determination? And look at all the ethical responsibilities that I have around it and, of course, the legal co uh, complications. Uh, thank you to our, our, our legal expert in the room here. Uh, the, the, the challenges we have in, in taking legal data and making determinations so that we can say we made the right determination based on information we received based on in our possession. So that information that we, we share uh, across the board is also such a major problem for us. And guess what? We've got more devices coming into the, uh, into the discussion. And right now, we have no way to figure out um, the, the information that's being delivered to me is the information that I can really use, number one. Number two, we also have patient portals and ability for people to upload their own data to their system, right? So we take in data from, from patients in a, in a portal format. That may or may not be true, may or may not be valid. Um, so, our, of course, our, our, our way we practice medicine is when we get data from somebody else, we basically discredit entire information to the system. It's something that we generate. How many of you guys have gone to a two ERs in the same week and have done the same tests? again and again and again, just purely because this ER does not realize that this ER actually had actually done the x-ray, had actually done the results, had actually pulled this information and made it work. It's, it, it happens, it's commonplace, because that's how our organizations work. We've got a, a protocol we need to follow, and we follow the protocol. So when I look at data that's coming from the outside, I discredit all of the data. It's interesting. I can actually validate the data that's coming from my own institution. That's how we operate. And that's how we operate for a long, long time. Even though a, an x-ray result that's, um, that can be used for the next period of 60 days without taking another x-ray result, if that can be validated from based on, if there's no change to the patient, I can use the same x-ray result. But we don't. We, we, we follow a process and methodology that allows us to kind of continuously pound with radiology facts back, back to the patient all the time. And that's an important factor. So now, if I have... Um, uh, if I have an IoT device that's coming in from, um, uh, from outside, how do I validate, vet it, make sure that it's not compromised? That's another factor we consider on a day-to-day -day basis. And guess what? These are IoT devices, right? This is what's happening to ours. The transformers that, uh, that, that we see on the screens are now walking on the streets, in a way. What do you mean by that? We have so much device proliferation right now that today, there is so much data that's being gathered by these devices and being pumped into some sort of system. Maybe in the, in the hard drive that starts singing or uh, in, in, in some sort of situation where it's being pumped to the cloud. There's so much data that, that's coming into the system. How do we take this data and kind of make sense of it in, in a way that, in, and one of the things that we are supposed to do is to drive costs. So I'll give you some examples here. So if you look at the example on the left, uh, where we have uh, a daily information being fed to the cloud, going to the doctor, going to the patient, and it's distributed across the board. That's a medical device that's being currently being used today in our world. This hospital systems on our right-hand side, you look at all the gadgets that are surrounding the patient, and uh, this is information that we get from <coughs> IoT's medical devices. Many of us know that there is, could be an attack that's on any single device that could have an adverse reaction, adverse effect on how the physician sees the data and how medication is prescribed to that patient. 
Imagine if I did this to a lab environment, right? So just think about it. Tomorrow you put your clothes to wash in your, wa in your, in your washing machine. There is a results analyzer sitting in the washing machine analyzing your, your sweat data and telling you if you did exercise or not. Could happen, right? And that information can be fed to the dog. Forget your Apple Watch, right? So th this, this is where I think life's changing. If I take the same information and do a lab results analysis of identifying if there's <coughs> cholesterol, if there's a increased glucose intake, or if there is uh, some other contraindication to what is happening from a rash perspective, for example, like a dermatology type of thing. You could do that. You could do that today. Are we doing that? Yes. In some respects, yes. We are not sharing that information today. There are organizations that, ca that are doing experiments on what's happening with that data that's coming out of dishwashers and washing machines. We never think that that's important. Right? We talk about, you know, uh, Amazon ordering milk because there's no milk in this Hampson refrigerator. Makes sense. But that's just one aspect of it. Imagine how we can take this data and pure, bring, bring about cure for patients, cure for various diseases and, and things that we suffer from day-to-day -day basis. So things happen there. And then if you look at on the left-hand side, right, the, the information where there's plenty of variable tech and going on, what we need to do there. And look at what the, the actual thought process is behind it, right? How should the new solution be? Exactly like the old one. So what, what, what have we changed? We've changed the fa fact that we got information coming from multiple EMR lab radiology systems into a physician that's taking that information and say, I want it, I used to have it this way, just give me the same information in a different form and that's I'm fine. So that's the thought process as well. There are some new things that's happening in the industry and I'll share, you, share with you something that's really cool. Cedar sinai many of you guys know Cedar sinai up in, uh, 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 not far from here. Uh, if people don't know Cedar sinai just look up Britney Spears. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, 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 they are tapping the Alexa from, uh, to, for a smart, uh, smart hospital pilot, smart uh, uh, hospital room pilot. And they, they, we had a patient there, uh, John Gooch, uh, who said that his voice activated listen is super cool. It's great, but is, it, is, is that super cool okay? Is that data accurate? Is that information fine? Can we rely on that information? So here's what we, we said we would do. We would take some similar, similar device and put them in our hospital rooms in here in, in Orange. We could do that. It cost us a, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, but we would do that. What, but then now, guess my life, what happens to my life, right? Somebody just messed my life. Guess what? I got uh, 400 more devices to manage. I got to make sure that there is no security vulnerability in any of those devices ongoing all the time, every time, because that information is being fed into my system. Oh, by the way, it's mine, so I can't say it's not. It's, I, can't, I can't discredit it. Today I do. Tomorrow I can because it's my device. And guess what happens? We will make determination based on information we get from your Alexa. Oh, he's listening to some mm, weird music. Maybe he needs to get to the site. <laughs> right? I could make the determination. I could do that tomorrow because I consider that weird. So it, it all depends on how we how we evaluate this information, how we pull this information, make use of that information for us. So what is concerning about IoT? Right? It's just another computer. Is it? Is it just another computer? Is it something beyond the computer? Is it something that really changes the way we think, breathe? and live, it's, it's, a, it's a different phenomenon. And we've never, I should say this, we as a uh, organism have matured over the course of years, Darwin in th theory, right? We have matured over the course of the years where we are seeing more technology take over our lives than what we used to any time before. Nobody can dispute that. And guess what happens? The more and more we've got IOTs out there, the more and more we have risks, more and more we have difficulties managing those risks and how we do this. So guess what happens? I report to a board. This is what the people at the top are thinking. This is what the people at the top are looking at, right? They are looking at, wait a minute, I need to do something strategically secure. Great. That means what? I should not have the CEO's name on the Orange County Register. That's the goal, right? Then. 
I have to have comprehensive, continuous security and privacy assessments. Think about it. If I put a new device, I have to have every time I put a new device in, I have to assess it to make sure it makes sense. Education and training. We got physicians, we got patients. We got patients who bring their own devices, physicians who also bring their own devices, except that they want to make it work in our network. I have to educate them, train them, help them understand what's the difference between cybersecurity and what's going on. Communication culture. It's all about communication and it's all about culture. You have a culture of understanding. So today, UCI Health, uh, among the other UCs, have done fairly well from a privacy and security perspective and we are benchmarked by a third party firm across the board. We've done, we're probably up there number one. And that's, that is the reason why. We've focused on delivering that communication, that culture to our patients and to our physicians in a way that makes sense for them. That is how, how many of you are here of WannaCry? When there was WannaCry, we had a major issue. We, we, all, of, all the UCs had a problem. Uh, I was actually in Chicago speaking at an event. Uh, we spent the two and a half days um, pulling together uh, what we should do across the board by m m multiple CISOs, all came together and had a conversation. It's funny that we never switched off our exchange. Many organizations did. Why? Because we had controls in place to say, what, where, where is it going to hit, what's going to hit, and how is it going to make it work. So we have, we have a process whereby we bring it all together and have a conversation together to understand what really happens in the industry. And of course, uh, strategy, right? We've got cost pressure, we've got uh, uh, dynamic threats, and escalating enforcement. So we've got, I, I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, we've got enforcement from the Medicare, which is the CMS, Center for Medicaid Services, Medicare Medicaid Services. Uh, we've got enforcement from OCR, which is the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, we've got enforcement from California Department of Public Health, CDPH. And we've got uh, tons of other local and uh, uh, regional enforcement capabilities that we all have to meet. Apart from all of that stuff, we've got the Joint Commission, which manages our ability to survive as a hospital system. So with all of this stuff, and all of the stuff that's going on, what do I do? How do I manage? I get, you know, Sam keeps talking about all these vulnerabilities we have in the mobile device security space, and we've got our legal guy keep saying, hey, this is something you need to watch for, this is something that we need to do. And I'm, I'm going to sue you if you don't do what you need, what, what I'm telling you to do, right? That's Brian's life. So when I look at these two competing factors, and you put me in the middle, guess what I do? I buckle down and kind of see what I can do from my myopic perspective and make sure I can put the right controls in place to make it work. So that's my life. Just to give you an idea where we are, what it is, and how we go about doing this stuff, this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Open to take questions. Well, I have a question. Sure. No one else does. Um, it's a little bit off topic, but as I'm sure you're aware, we have a very significant informatics practice here, uh, group here at, at the at the at ICS. Do you see a time coming when physicians will be potentially liable for malpractice? Although I don't actually sue doctors, but uh, if they don't use AI and machine learning to help their diagnoses, yes, it's already happening. Um, I think there's a Stanford study. Uh, that occurred that were people are talking about the fact that we have to bring in technology into the way we operate. Uh, <coughs> today, uh, there's a regulation called information blocking. I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, where if you do not use the EMR to actually document and make it work, and you're able, not able to share that information with other physicians, you are considered to be information blocking in the sense that you are blocking information traveling within the healthcare environment. So AI, machine learning, stuff that's that's really happening is 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 just there. It's just it, it's not in the it's not in the regulation yet, but that's the next step in terms of what we're going to see in, in the process. Um, the other plug I'd like to make is um, you know um, any of the any grads here from uh, the institute uh, send me a note. Uh, we are hiring as well, so just just in case people are interested in healthcare or cybersecurity. Uh, definitely that's another uh, angle you want to pursue. And uh, secondly, I also teach at the uh, University of Texas affiliate, uh, faculty at the University of Texas, and there is a brand new course we are doing on cyber security in healthcare. Just, just focused on healthcare. It's such a huge, huge market. Uh, and we struggle with getting the right, uh, you know, uh, to be on the topic for workforce development, but we have some challenges in workforce development. 
that also I think will, will help. So if there's in the folks from here that are interested in uh, you know in a, in a career in healthcare cybersecurity, send me a note. And uh, if somebody Google's your name and you see how your email's there? Yeah, email's there. In fact, uh, the email is right on top of my first slide, I think. Yes, it's there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you, guys. Oh. Thank you. All right. That was excellent. Thank you. Our next presenter uh, is Professor Alfred Chen. Alfred joined ICS this past year as assistant professor uh, in computer science, and uh, uh, Alfred and one of our other new assistant professors are occupying positions that were newly created a couple of years ago by ICS and by the Chancellor's Office, specifically uh, around cybersecurity, so we're very proud and excited about that. Uh, I, I have to uh, say I was actually on Alfred's uh, recruiting committee, evaluation committee, so if he does a really great job, just keep in mind, I was on the selection committee. If he doesn't do a great job, keep in mind, I didn't actually have a vote. I was just an expert. Uh, so Alfred has, uh, his research has had significant impact in both academia and industry with over 10 top-tier conference papers, as HHS, U.S. CERT alert, multiple common vulnerability discoveries, and more than 50 news articles in major media, such as Fortune and BBC. Alfred uh, received his PhD from the University of Michigan in 2018. Let's welcome Alfred. So uh, for both of these um, technologies, they basically give some sensors uh, to these physical um, entities which were isolated in the past. And uh, as uh, pointed out by uh, Kevin, by many of his uh, recent work, so the sensors um, definitely has problems, right? And so the question for me is that, okay, so, so how about the software building upon this uh, kind of sensors? So how these problems at the sensor level, uh, at the sensor level can actually affect the software, le uh, the software level decisions? And also, more importantly, how can we build more secure and robust uh, software on top of this uh, soft, uh, the <coughs> sensor level problems? So, uh, in the, um, so for these two problems, I guess um, many of you might wonder why is that is. And I guess most importantly, um, to my interest, this will make me very cool, right? <laughs> so uh, these are uh, very fancy technologies, and then uh, finding problems in them just give me lots of publicity. So cool. <laughs> uh, but 
<laughs> just um, so jokes aside, so um, more important. So these systems are super important, right? So because many of these technologies are actually used in our physical world, physical, the physical transportation environment. So any security problems in this kind of software systems will have a direct impact on our physical life, or more, um, uh, or more specifically, our uh, road safety. And also as a researcher or um, professor. So I'm also very interested in this kind of systems because this systems has many new design components uh, as opposed to the, the traditional like, software. So also many of this um, domain specific software logics which makes a researchers naturally wondering about what, whether this new, not new logic, new components will actually introduce new security problems. So uh, starting from last year, I started to um, um, looking at this space uh, and do some first security uh, software security analysis on, on both sides, on some preventive system on both sides, which uh, were both accepted by top tier security conferences. So um, first, let's look at the connected vehicle side. So in this work, um, we are trying to do the first software security analysis of a connected vehicle based transportation system, namely this uh, intelligent traffic uh, signal system, which is uh, ISIC for short. So in this system, what they do is that they basically give some communication devices to the cars so that they can send some data to an RSU, this called roadside unit, uh, which will track the dedicated location and speed of the car. And then they will send this data, basically this real-time connected vehicle data, to the, this ISIC system. And then this ASIC system will run some optimization algorithms to compute a very good optimal traffic control um, decisions and then just push that into the um, traffic controller, basically the traffic light. So um, in this study, we are targeting uh, the uh, USDOT, the, U the United States uh, Department of Transportation, sponsored design and, and implementation, which uh, has actually been fully implemented and tested in um, uh, places like <laughs> Anthem and also Palato, which shows a very impressive like 30% uh, reduction in the total vehicle delay in one single interception. Really impressive. And then because of this, uh, this system is actually under deployment in uh, New York City and also Canada. So for this kind of systems, where can be the attackers, right? So in our work, we assume that basically the vehicle owners can be malicious, right? So basically what they do is that they deliberately send um, but they control that will be with the onboard unit, which is the CV device on the car, to send spoof data to the uh, ASIC system with the hope that, okay, maybe we can influence the control to the advantage of the attacker. So here we assume that OBU, the, the onboard unit, or OBU, can be compromised by physically or wirelessly by malware, which uh, has uh, real demonstrations in the past by some of this previous work, like down here. So with this attacker, so what can be the, the attack goals, right? What, what the attacker wants, wants to do. So one thing um, directly the attacker can do is to cause traffic congestion, right? So really okay, this, the, the point of this whole system is to decrease the total vehicle delay. So how about we just reverse that? We just try to increase the total delay. But okay, this is very evil. And then uh, on the other side, um, another potential attack goal is to uh, to achieve personal gains, right? So how about we just minimize our the attacker's own travel time, but of course this is at the cost of the other vehicle's travel time, right? So in this work, we did the first study. We targeted this first one, this uh, traffic congestion uh, scenario. So with this goal and also this attacker, so these are the analysis methodology, which is automated. So uh, at the core of this analysis, this is something called this dynamic software analysis, um, and for this analysis, they will take some input from the traffic, uh, make some snapshot of traffic situations from the simulator. And on the other side, we will take a look at the source code of this uh, ASIC system, which will do automatic analysis of the uh, attack input data flow, which will conclude a bunch of these data spoofing strategies. And then in this analysis, we basically enumerate all these possible spoofing options from these strategies, and then calculate the increased uh, total vehicle delay. So this will uh, output a bunch of this uh, highest or at least high delay increase um, spoofing options to us, the developers, uh, or the, uh, uh, the, the testers. So basically what we do is that we will conclude a bunch of this um, congestion creation vulnerabilities. And then we do not actually just stop there. So we actually go ahead and make this really, really the concrete and practical. We actually construct the actual escalates, uh, which can cause traffic congestion. 
So, uh, so here is uh, some of the high-level uh, summary of what we found. So basically, we find that there are some vulnerabilities at, at, at the design level and also the implementation level of this uh, ASIC system, which can actually allow even the spoof data from one single type vehicle in a, in a intersection to greatly manipulate the traffic control. So uh, basically here, let's say this is the road, and then uh, there's an attacker here. So what the attacker can do is that they can actually uh, just inject some spoof data to trick the, 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 the smart control algorithm to think that first, there are many ghosts, the, these vehicles in this traffic lane, uh, in, case, uh, in the cases that this lens doesn't have anything, any cars on the same side. And then uh, this can basically trick this uh, whole traffic control decisions to waste lots of time uh, for this one traffic lane. And then the other thing we can do is that we can extend a green light, uh, um, which is controllable by the attacker by spoofing as a late arriving vehicle. There are many details behind this, uh, but due to the time limit, I cannot really cover those. But I just want to show a demo about what's going on in this kind of uh, systems. So, So, yeah, so, but, so a better thing is the traffic simulator, which is a commercial grade traffic simulator called Visim. Uh, so, what we do here is that, okay, this is the real bird eye view uh, <coughs> of a intersection near my, my previous, uh, my, my um, uh, PhD granting uh, uh, institution in the University of Michigan. And then we uh, use its uh, real world layout, and also the traffic uh, signal configuration uh, in this demo. So here the blue cars are connected, but look at the CV equipped vehicles, but the red cars are not. And then to maximize the, the realism, we actually go into this intersection and then videotape the traffic flow and then count the cars and use that as a model to, for this simulation. So here, uh, like I said earlier, there's only one single type of vehicle in this intersection, which actually there's a, a speedway here. So we assume that attacker can just park here and then do the attack. So here's what happens. So on the left, this is a wizard attack, and on the right, this is a wizard attack. Uh, at the beginning, everything seems to be normal, but after like 30 minutes, as you can see, the left side has just no uh, traffic congestion, but on the right side, there's this massive traffic jam has been created. So if we look closely at what's really happening there, so basically, as you can see, the left turn uh, light doesn't get enough uh, um, green light duration, so it actually speed over, and then this blocks this 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 whole traffic lane, um, the street lane, and then uh, during this period, the, uh, the travel time is actually six times higher for half of the vehicles, and then uh, sixteen times higher for twenty two of the vehicles. So as you can see, this is another example with this long line of uh, on traffic jams. So this is about the connected vehicle side. And uh, the second part uh, that I'll, uh, I would like to discuss is about the uh, autonomous vehicle side. So for this systems, we did the first uh, software analysis of the AV software. So what you hear just uh, is um, what what Kevin was talking about. The new attack surface of these autonomous vehicles are the sensors, <coughs> as opposed to the traditional software. So for autonomous vehicles, uh, they are making their critical. Um, vehicle, control, vehicle control decisions purely based on this uh, input channel, this sensor input channel. And if you think about it, this is actually a public channel in the transportation environment, right? Because it's, it's actually shared with potential adversaries, which makes, uh, which, which makes this actually a fundamentally unavoidable attack surface. So uh, for this work, uh, we, took a, uh, we take a look at something called LIDAR, the light-based detection and ranging. So if uh, you can uh, take a look at this. This is basically the uh, uh, sensor locations on the autonomous vehicle. So we are looking at something like here. Uh, this uh, LiDAR device on top of the, the car. Why? This, this looks something new with no camera, with no GPS, but for, for the autonomous vehicle, LiDAR sounds like something we haven't been um, taking a close look before. So to give some to give some bad physics, basically the lidar system they, they will use light. They will you, 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 you will use lasers. They will shoot lasers to the surrounding uh, physical environment, and then to create this high resolution three D um, point cloud, which they call this particular cloud of points, data points of the surrounding, to ensure the safety of their control. So uh, for lidar, there are indeed some attacks uh, before. So this is. 
Uh, one new attack we uh, are uh, especially interested in is this called LIDAR spoofing. So basically, since you, uh, since, since the, 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 the physics of, of the LIDAR device actually leverage the, the LIDAR passes that are uh, echo back from the obstacles to, uh, to uh, view <coughs> the obstacles uh, around the vehicle. So how we just shoot lasers uh, to the LIDARs to inject some spoof points. So this is uh, a, a figure from this previous work. So basically what they did is that they put a, a LiDAR device inside a room and then inject uh, this, um, inject this um, uh, uh, lasers into the LiDAR. And this is what they did. We could add a bunch of this, um, looks like a random uh, points uh, uh, in front of the LiDAR. So this is the sensor lab, right? You can do something here. But then the question is that how can I use this to actually attack the, the, the autonomous vehicle or the autonomous driving software logic, right? So this is what we do. So we did the first security analysis. We target a system called this Baidu Apollo, which is a production um, grid system. It's already driving some buses in China. The to our advantage, to the advantage of the researchers, this is, this um, um, platform is actually open source. So why? Uh, because they want to be the android of the uh, self-driving car ecosystem so that they can dominate the market so later, just like android. So uh, it's already partnered with like 100 more um, car companies, like some big brands like BMW and Ford. So it is a tech tier, so here's what we do. So uh, let's say this is road and there's a self-driving car like, running here. So the attackers uh, set up a roadside device to shoot some lasers to, to this car. And then by doing this, the, the attacker hopes to inject some fake uh, obstacles, <laughs> like objects in front of the car, which, uh, was, uh, which is hoped by the attacker to actually trigger some undesired uh, control decisions or control options, uh, operations like the uh, emergency brake or something else, right? So here is the overview of the methodology of this analysis. So basically what we do is that first, we need to model the attack input perturbation, basically the sensor input. So, by, uh, so to do this, we model the LIDAR spoof attack uh, by um, uh, uh, first uh, um, reproducing this uh, LIDAR spoof attack in our, uh, uh, in our lab, and then we model it uh, mathematically. And then we uh, also model the pre-processing steps of this LiDAR pro uh, processing the pipeline into the uh, into an analytical function, so we can do analysis. So the second thing is that this whole LiDAR-based uh, AV perception, how it's driving uh, this perception, is based on machine learning. It's based on a uh, on deep learning uh, network. So uh, what is, so then what we do is that we need to do security analysis. So basically, we formulate the problem and solve an optimization problem. Uh, over a DNN model, the, uh, this deep learning model. So uh, last but not least, we also wonder about the security or safety impl uh, implications of the problems we found, uh, we will find, so uh, which can help us understand the, the attack impact on the um, driving decision level and also the uh, road safety. So uh, uh, long story short, so this is what we found, we succeed uh, otherwise, I won't be speaking today. Uh, so this is a uh, snapshot of a uh, of Apollo of by the Apollo's official uh, simulator called Sim Control. So basically, what we did is that okay, tech is here. We show something in this direction, and then this is able to inject an in obstacle just right in front of the car. So there are definitely many details behind this. How we achieve this? There are many tweaks uh, about how we actually. So reach to this stage, but uh, I will not be I'll be talking about that due to the uh, time limitation. So after knowing this, so the next question is, is that what we can do with this obstacle? So one thing is that we can probably trigger emergency brake, right? So this is what we found. So in this uh, Bible Apollo's official simulation, we are able to cast the autonomous vehicle to decrease speed from this 43 kilometer per hour to like zero, just within one second. Which is a very, which is a very harsh uh, break, which may hurt the passengers. Assuming this is like a self-driving taxi in the future, and the second thing, which is potentially more surprising, is that we found out that uh, we can do something called this car freezing. So let's say there's a car waiting for the red light uh, in the intersection. So we can we can just put an obstacle in front of it, uh, with hope that you freezing this car like forever and then blocking traffic which could hurt the mobility of traffic. 
So, uh, to, to conclude basically today, uh, I basically show my uh, initial attempts uh, about doing this first uh, research uh, uh, analysis <coughs> into the uh, security, basically social security <coughs> of the connected and autonomous vehicle systems. So we did some, uh, we discovered new attacks, uh, analyzed root causes, and also demonstrated some uh, security and safety imp uh, implications. And uh, just to conclude, basically, I believe this is only the beginning of the connected vehicle, uh, connected and autonomous vehicle software security research. And uh, this is a inherently interdisciplinary direction, and I'm definitely open to collaboration. So this is some of my information again, and uh, I'm open to take questions if there are any. Yeah, thanks. Manufacturers have different approaches to autonomous driving. Some mm -hmm. are betting on LiDAR, some are betting on other things. Is there a, a possibility that each sensor also could interfere with each other if they start, you know, doing that? <laughs> right, right. Uh, that's a really good question. So um, I think for LiDAR, we actually think it's possible, but the likelihood is actually very, very low because the LiDAR is, is choosing lights at the light speed. And then two LIDARs are actually like rotating uh, in term, uh, when they are scanning the environment. So likelihood of that the receivers and the 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 the, the, uh, the center of the LIDAR or the, or the LIDAR uh, uh, shooter are actually in exactly the same direction is very low. So I guess that's probably why um, big companies for LIDAR like Valentine uh, do not actually like recognize uh, this uh, LiDAR passes. Uh, they just just reuse the same LiDAR passes for all the LiDARs. Uh, but this could happen. But if and if that that happens, you'll definitely have some robustness uh, issue. And then uh, we could think about the is this possible for attackers to deliberately <coughs> trigger that, which could make the things even worse. So a little bit off topic, but um, some people just want a Tesla by hacking it successfully, and I thought. You of all people might know what they did. Does that apply at all? Uh, for this one? Yeah. Uh, so uh, at this point, I, uh, um, according to recent news, so, uh, so Elon Musk don't believe that LIDAR is um, necessary for autonomous driving, which there are many debates uh, in the research field, even for the uh, autonomous driving uh, te technology field. So uh, for this particular attack, because uh, like Tesla doesn't really use sure. a LiDAR, so this doesn't really apply. Yep. But for many others like Waymo or uh, like Google Waymo and also like this Baidu, uh, um, Apollo, this will uh, apply. So I have a quick question, Alfred. Um, I know Department of Homeland Security has said that one of the potential attacks they're worried about at the 2020 election is that an attacker would figure out which polling places they want people not to get to and jam up the traffic. But obviously, you can't really do that at scale unless you can do it remotely. Do any of your exploits suggest the ability to do it, do the attack remotely, or do you have to be at a particular intersection to do it? Right. Um, uh, this is a good question. So uh, for this particular one, because the the, the connected vehicle uh, communication range is actually 200 meters, so you you, you have to be there. But then, uh, if you consider the case that if some of the cars can be remotely like, controlled, like autonomous vehicles, this can be due autonomously. Alfred, next we have, hope I'm going to pronounce this right, uh, Sina Fazy. It's a senior PhD student in computer engineering, uh, uh, computer science and engineering here at UCI. Over the last three years as a student, he's published multiple articles in prestigious uh, design, automation, and security conferences. Uh, and lately, he's discovered a threat to DNA synthesizer machines, which has received lots of media attention from news sources such as the New York Times. Forbes, uh, IEEE Spectrum, etc. Today he's going to talk about his work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Brian. Uh, so today uh, I'm presenting our work in behalf of my professor, for, uh, for Mohammad Al Faru. Uh, we do lots of interesting research in our laboratory in Advanced Integrated Cyber Physical Systems Lab. Uh, here at UCI, 
which I urge you to look at our website. We hack different machines, we hack 3D printers, we work on uh, possible new solutions for lightweight uh, communication methodologies. But today, uh, since I'm a student and I'm interested in one particular project uh, in particular, I'm going to present uh, my latest work on finding a threat to DNA synthesizers. Uh, this work was a result of a collaboration between UC Irvine and UC Riverside as a part of an effort to produce uh, high throughput secure DNA synthesizers. Okay, so I understand that the majority of you here probably don't remember much from their biology class in high school. So let's start with some basics. DNA molecules. Uh, the biological information of all living organisms are stored and transferred th uh, through DNA molecules. These molecules are built with four base types, A, G, C, and T. Different variation of uh, the AGCTs in these molecules translate to different functionalities in living organism and basically uh, builds all the nature around us. But the DNA molecules are not only produced in nature uh, anymore. Uh, in, over the last dec uh, decade, automated DNA synthesizers have emerged and we can now uh, artificially synthesize these <coughs> molecules in the laboratory environment. Uh, right now, uh, the, uh, the security field of DNA synthesizers <coughs> are only focused on one aspect of these machines, and, that, and that's bioterrorism. The fact is, some of these the synthetic <coughs> DNA molecules can be used to uh, create deadly diseases which can result in, in uh, extinction of human beings. So to avoid this, uh, governments have created uh, uh, different regulations, they have monitoring systems, and they train people who work with these machines. Uh, on the other hand, there are, um, it's known that uh, uh, synthetic technologies are vulnerable to new threats. In particular, Peter Nick from University <coughs> of Washington recently showed that it's possible to synthesize a DNA molecule which can cause um, overstack, uh, overflow problem uh, in a, a DNA sequencer's uh, framework. Today I'm going to challenge a different aspect of uh, uh, synthetic DNA technology. Over the uh, last 20, 30 years, many companies have vested interest in, uh, in synthetic DNA molecules. They use these molecules to create new uh, drugs, uh, uh, come up new medical treatment procedures, and they even create disease-resistant crops to feed the growing population of the earth. For, uh, at, uh, in each of these applications, uh, engineers, uh, bioengineers, what they do, they come up with, they engineer a particular DNA sequence to have a certain functionality. To come up with that particular DNA sequence, they put lots of money, lots of uh, research uh, time, uh, research on to just come up with that sequence, which means that now that sequence is an intellectual pro uh, property, and it needs to be protected against possible adversaries. Especially when it's in the, the research phase and it has not been patented yet. So today I'm uh, going to present to you a new acoustic side channel attack methodology against DNA synthesizer. And then I'm going to talk about interesting algorithms that can be used uh, which can help uh, the, the, uh, the, the, an attacker to actually understand the whole, uh, the whole meaning of a synthesized sequence. And at the end I will give you some uh, countermeasures to my attack. <coughs> So uh, my attack, uh, in my attack, basically, 
Uh, what we do, we suggest that the attacker can simply put a recording device in close proximity to the DNA synthesizer. So this recording device can be simply a phone. And uh, the attacker can be a disgruntled employee, a visitor to lab who forgets uh, who leaves <coughs> the phone in, clo uh, in very close distance from the DNA synthesizer, or uh, the attacker medium can be a, an IoT device or a laptop which is hacked around the DNA synthesizer. You have access to the microphone and you can collect the acoustic noise that the DNA synthesizer is generating. Once uh, the attacker collects this acoustic noise, he uses his pre-trained uh, profiling DNA synthesizer system to see what the, uh, what the machine was doing while generating those sounds. He estimates the uh, uh, particular DNA sequence <coughs> that it was uh, being synthesized and sells, that his sells his predictions for a profit to a competing company. Uh, before going to uh, talking about the um, uh, uh, prediction uh, functions that the uh, uh, attacker uses, let's see how a DNA synthesizer works. Basically, uh, uh, <coughs> commonly used DNA synthesizers carry out four repetitive steps to produce the output DNA molecule. In the second step of uh, this uh, sequence, they deliver the particular base type that, uh, that carries the functionality, which we call it base delivery. While uh, the DNA synthesizer is working, it <coughs> generates a noise. Can you hear it? Yeah. It generates a noise like this, which is basically a continuous noise followed by a couple of clicks once in a while. By studying the structure of the DNA synthesizer, what we found out that the continuous noise is from the fluids running in the pipes of the machine, and solenoid valves controlling these fluids are responsible for the uh, click-like noises once in a while. Uh, and actually, with further studies, we found out that these noises can be easily uh, mapped to the particular uh, to the uh, repetitive. Uh, sequence that was uh, happening uh, with just simply reading the user manual of the machine. You can follow where uh, the, the, <coughs> what, uh, each step is happening then. And you can pinpoint the, the exact portion of the signal where the uh, delivery ba base delivery happened. So the next step after pinpointing those portions is figuring out what uh, base type that particular uh, base delivery bus, which you, we use a state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms and feature engineering to do that. So, uh, so we use a profiling DNA synthesizer with a training DNA sequence, and we carry out many uh, initial um, uh, synthesis to see what noises the machine generates. We pre-process those uh, uh, acoustic signal to to eliminate noise in the environment, and then we, uh, we uh, segment the signal and extract the particular um, uh, particular base delivery signal. And we, uh, you know, we extract uh, frequency and time domain features from our signal, fitted along with the labels to our uh, base classifiers to uh, train our models to make predictions what base type the delivery was. Once uh, we've trained our uh, classifier, the, the attacker tool is basically ready. He can simply record the noise and use his classifier to predict what was the each base delivery type. Also, he can even uh, the attacker can even use some application-specific post-processes, uh, post-processing methodology to further improve his prediction. I will get into it by the end of the slide. And once he's done, he will just have the stolen DNA sequence. He can sell it for a competing company. So, um, uh, the. A post-processing methodology can basically tell you if your predictions are valid or not, if uh, the particular predicted DNA sequence can be synthesized or not at all. Uh, how the uh, 
what happens if we decide that the predicted DNA sequence as a whole uh, is faulty and we need another prediction? What's the next best prediction? Let's take at the predictions that a classifier makes. For example, here you see that um, uh, the classifier is returning four probabilities for the first element. It says that with 90% accuracy, probably it is, it's the base delivery type A in the uh, first delivery. In the second one, with 80%, it is C. And in the last one, with 40% uh, probability, it is, uh, del uh, it's delivery type G again. So here, if we always uh, ideally choose the, the highest probability, we will end up with the best prediction which here is ADG. And uh, if we need a second be uh, best uh, prediction, we can probably come up with an intuitive way that, okay, so in the last <coughs> delivery, the probability of having G and C were pretty close. So if our prediction was wrong, it is going to be, uh, it's going to do something with the last prediction, right? But what about the third one? What if we, uh, we determine that even AGC is wrong. There should be another prediction. We need another prediction. Then it's not intuitive anymore. We have to do, do a brute forcing all over the combination, which is <coughs> four to the power of number of deliveries, and calculate uh, each one of the pro uh, multiplication of all the probabilities to say that what's the next predi best prediction. So we came up with an algorithm which involves creating a directed acyclic graph with weighted edges. So basically, I map my predictions uh, to, the, to a DAG by starting to build the DAG with adding a start and end node. Then for each base type delivery, I add four nodes to my uh, graph, which corresponds to each type. Then I, uh, the, I, I connect the consecutive layers uh, with weighted edges. And weight of each edge will correspond to the logarithm of uh, the particular probability of having that uh, type in, in, the, in the delivery that we are aiming to, that we are going to see. So for example, here, uh, we see that for the first delivery it is 0 0.9 and the edge to the A type here uh, is, has much more weight in compared to the other. So the idea is that in this graph, um, any pass from start to end node will represent a prediction. And if we, uh, we have a way to find the uh, k longest passes from start to end node, then we will have our k best uh, algorithm. Which actually from uh, graph to, uh, theory, it's not that difficult to achieve. And it is possible to show that in this particular graph, uh, when it's shaped like this and when it's a DAG, we can find the pa uh, k longest passes from start to end node with just uh, n log m plus k which is much better than four to the power of number of deliveries that we had before. <coughs> okay, uh, so <coughs> this is our experimental setup. Our experimental setup consists of a DNA synthesizer called AB3400, which is one of the most widely used DNA synthesizers in the industry. Uh, we, uh, we talked with a salesman and he said that the whole industry basically has two DNA synthesizers dominating everything. It's one of the AB3400 is one of them, then uh, the other one, AB341, basically dominates 90% of the uh, whole industry, DNA synthesis in industry. We used that machine and we placed a recorder in 10 centimeter proximity to that and started to uh, record the acoustic noise that the machine generates. And uh, to evaluate, we basically, we are going to see that, first of all, is it possible to train our classifier? Then we, we, uh, we are going to see what's the noise effect on our attack methodology. And at the end, I will, uh, see, uh, we also conducted a few experiments <coughs> to see what's the effect of distance of the microphone from the DNA sensors. 
Here you see that it's possible to uh, train a classifier with probably only 100 training samples, which is actually pretty good and achieves a, a the good classifiers achieve around 88% accuracy on average. <coughs> we also uh, added some synthetic noises to our collected data. Noises such as brown, pink, for example, pink uh, here uh, duplicates kind of the air conditioner that is working in the same room. And we also added a conversation, just two people talking, we added to the signal to see what will be the effect of that. And we added some other types of noise, like white noise or blue noise to the uh, signal as well. And the interesting thing that we noticed was that uh, typical noises that we can find in a room, like two people talking to each other or the air conditioner noise, will not have a significant effect on our prediction. To give you a pointer here, a tangible pointer here, uh, our, um, when two people are talking, it's usually happening around here, around 60 to 65 decibel. And you see here, it doesn't have any effect on our predictions. Um, but, uh, and the other types of noise, usually they don't even exist in the room. So we, uh, if we want to avoid this attack, we probably should focus on the other types of noise. And at the end, we evaluated the effect of distance. What we did was basically we kept the uh, room uh, noise level pr uh, room noise level the same, but we reduced the sound pressure level of the noise that we were collecting from the DNA synthesizer. And our results show that actually, even if we go uh, 0 0.7 meters further from the DNA synthesizer, it's, it's still our attacker can work. So we can put your phone anywhere around uh, on the DNA synthesizer. So um, uh, our uh, attack methodology was working uh, uh, based on some random DNA sequences. But we were interested to see that uh, our attack methodology is going to really work. So what we did, we asked one of our collaborators to synthesize a meaningful DNA sequence without telling us anything about it. And I recorded the noise of the machine while uh, it was producing that particular DNA molecule. I made my prediction and sent an email to, the, uh, uh, to our collaborator. Here is his response to us. Out of 45 uh, base type predictions that we had, there was only six positions right, meaning that on average we were a uh, able to uh, reach the expected accuracy that we, uh, we had it in our initial experiment. So on average we had 88% accuracy, but is that enough? The answer is actually yes. If you remember, the last step of our attack was using, using some post-processing methodologies. <coughs> Here, for example, we knew that uh, the synthesized DNA molecules are meaningful and they have some bio uh, applications. So we used uh, one publicly available uh, tool. This tool is available by NIH, um, National Institute of Health. And, um, this tool basically works like an autocorrector. Uh, auto if you give it a <coughs> DNA sequence, it will tell you uh, what that DNA sequence does, what, what uh, other places that DNA sequence has been seen. So I fed both uh, the original DNA sequence and the predicted DNA sequence. This tool returned the same result, almost same result for both DNA sequences. In both scenarios, you can see that it reported insulin as a case, as a possible case. So um, I introduced the uh, attack methodology. The, the countermeasures can be uh, somewhat uh, simple to do. The, maybe you just want to add some uh, the noise absorbent material to your system or add some artificial <coughs> noise. Or uh, maybe it can be just a software update to the DNA synthesizer. Just the user manual of the machine <coughs> tell, told me everything that I needed to know about it. Maybe just uh, 
A base delivery segment of classification in the machine is possible, and simple systems of variable conf will make an attack much more harder. And at the end, probably the best way is to just not let anyone inside your secret laboratory, right? Okay. Okay, so this was uh, our attack, and <coughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And by the way, this work was published in uh, NDSS, which is one of the best security conferences just a couple of months ago. Questions? Sir. Uh, this is just a voice or a noise? Yeah. Exactly, actually that, well, that's very interesting. In laboratory environment, they have sensors that to monitor sound events. It may be, uh, may, I didn't know about it at least. They, they install some sensor to just monitor the noise in the environment. Like they want to see if a refrigerator uh, gives error, it creates a beep, beep, beep that it is ready. So they have put a sensor, and it's actually like Alex signed the sensor. So if you can hack them, you can uh, collect lots of acoustic noise from the lab. And this work uh, was particularly DNA synthesizer, but uh, our lab is focusing on like different types of biomedical uh, tools that uh, can be used. For example, we showed that similar attack methodology is possible to 3D printers. We can steal the data that 3D printers are making. Yeah, I, I actually had a question about that. So. Um, do you guys sort of have a target list of, you know, having done 3D printers and having done DNA <coughs> synthesizers? Here's a bunch of other devices that we think would be susceptible to the same. Are you kind of working through a list? Uh, so basically, we, we the 3D printer was the first work right. to show this, and later we just wanted to see that okay, we had one test case study, but is it possible to apply the same methodology to other? At the moment, we saw that it is possible to probably go to the other medical devices, and we are we are not going to continue to just hack the one after another, but we are trying to come up with what are the basics of uh, the, uh, the things that are causing this problem, like how we can come up with a more general solution that if, a, if your machine is making noise, maybe it is leaking data, just follow these rules to see that if there are uh, inform if there are in information in it or not and how you can protect it but at the moment we are we are stopped with this second one have you also looked at the electrical signals because when the electrical it machine is and it generates different signals uh, yes actually that's very interesting if you put it, we uh, there are many side channels to a working machine. One of them is electrical, acoustic noise. This can be just vibration. It can be the heat that the machine generates or the electromagnetic field that it creates. If you put your phone in close proximity to any of these machines, while it is working, your, uh, uh, your accelerometer sensors will act differently. Like the, uh, the first fact that uh, Professor Wu was saying, uh, just the uh, magnetic fields that uh, these machines are creating, it can be observed through many sensors that we have. Have you been in contact with any of the manufacturers of these, uh, this equipment? Uh, actually, the, we have been. They, they were very interested, but there was one catch here. Um, so <coughs> this uh, machine was, is, uh, old, is an old machine. It's like five, ten years old. and. People are trying to go to the next step, and uh, the next machines they are they don't have big actuators, they don't have big solenoid valve pipe going around. Uh, basically, everything is built inside the chip. It's like <coughs> a tree, uh, just a regular printer. They print everything on a piece of paper, and they were not. Uh, they were saying that this is a valid point, but if we go to the next uh, next technology, this might not. A valid uh, attack, but in general, it's good to think of, uh, about the possible attacks in the new technologies as well. Yeah, well, that, that's so, one of our themes: is identifying gaps and trying to get people to fill them. So that that works out mm -hmm. great.